Jason Peacock. Today I'm here to talk about The Godfather, Corleone's Empire by Eric Lang, published by Kumini or Not. This is a two to five player game and it takes 60 to 90 minutes to play. I'm gonna give you an overview of the rules and then I'm gonna start talking about my thoughts. So I'm all set up for a two player game. A two-player game is the only time you start with three thugs, the square bases, instead of two. Each player gets a $1 bill, a $2 bill, a $3 bill, and a random job card dealt at the start of the game. Each player also has their control markers right here. You place these down at the end of the round if you have more dominance in a certain territory. And I will explain that. Right here are randomly flipped up allies. They are also gonna be bid on during the bribery phase. There's six for each act and you're gonna flip up the amount of players minus one. So if this was a two player game, there would in fact only be one there. This here is the resources, your blood money, your guns, booze, and drugs, which doesn't come into play until act three. And then of course your money stacks. At no time can you make change with the bank for money. And that is very important in this game. Over here, we have public jobs. There's the number of public jobs equal to the number of players. Whoever's seen The Godfather the most recently gets this horse head token, and they are the first player. On your turn, you can do one of four things. But before we get into the family business phase, take a look at our little car up here. This thing moves around the different phases of the game. Completely overproduced little car, but it's still cool. And we have a miniature of Don Corleone that keeps track of the rounds. There's four rounds of the game. So the first thing we do in a turn is we grab a new location tile and we put it on the lowest number that uh, needs one. So the starting round of the game is one. And if you're playing with more than two players, um, the game can automatically start with some of these on there before you place your first one. Next, you move the car up, and honestly, I never even touch the car because everyone can just keep track of what's going on. Now as the family business stage, you can do one of four things. You can place a square base dude on the front of a business and shake that business down. You simply get whatever is on the car. There's not a lot of variety in what you get. It's all very simple symbolism. Um, so this I would take a $1 bill and I would get a gun resource. If I went here, this little symbol is a job card. Anytime you take a job card, you are always grabbing two and picking one you want and discarding the other. Uh, this suitcase here is how you launder money. That's how you take cards from your hand and put it into your tin. Whoever has the most money in their tin at the end of the game is going to be the winner. You're going to want to launder money because if you get stuck with too many cards in your hand at the end of the round, you're going to have to discard. I'll go into a little more detail in a bit. That's one thing we can do. The next thing we can do is place a family member, the round base guys, on a family member spot. Some of the spots are marked with a 3+, plus, which means in a two-player game they cannot be used. Now, when you place a family member, you can see this guy is adjacent to one, two, three different territories. He is going to get the icon at the back of every business that he is connected to. So he'll be able to launder money, he'll be able to draw two job cards and pick one, he'll grab a gun, and he'll grab another gun. The third thing you can do is play an ally card. You're not going to have any on the first turn, but if you did, you would simply play one down. For example, this small time bookie, for each turf you control, you add one dollar to your suitcase. It's a cool ability. Some allies are just cards. And some of them will be a mini that you actually place on the board. And some of these guys are, repeat themselves in each act, but they get more and more powerful as the game goes on. The fourth thing you can do is complete a job. These are job cards. And there is not a ton of variety in the job cards. There is four different colors. At the end of the game, whoever has the most of each color is going to get a bonus five points. So this right here, the icons on the left, is the cost. This job here is only one booze bottle. 
This is the benefit and then you always get reward money. Again, you have to take a three. If there happens to not be any threes in the stack, you would take the next highest down, which is a one. So other players discard a card, you may choose one and suitcase it. This is the heart of the game, doing the jobs. You can do a private job from your hand or any of the public jobs down here. Car bomb, it's expensive, three guns, but you gun down all enemy players in one turf. Gunning someone down means you take their standard dudes and you put them in the river. That would include any family members that are connected. It's a good way to clear out a region, especially near the end of a round when you're gonna be going for area control. So those are the four things you can do. Place a thug, square base, place a family member, round base, do a job, or play an ally. Once everybody's done placing their icons, we move to that territory control phase. Whoever has the most influence in a region would get a control marker. This region here, green has one, red has one. It's a tie, so nobody has dominance. If red had another guy here, red would have two, green would have one, and then red would place their control marker. These things right here, this is a green one, but they would go in that territory. Control markers are cool because in the following round, if someone puts a thug down on the front of a business, whoever controls that turf also gets to take that action. It doesn't affect family members when they get the back of a business action, and it only applies to whoever's on the top of the pile. So if the second round red had dominance, he would put his on top of the green. At the end of the game, whoever has the most in each of these regions on the board gets five points per region. If there's a tie, whoever is more on top would break that tie. Once the turf control is done, we drive the car to the bribery phase. And this is the one thing that makes these suitcases here a little bit less of a gimmick. People take money from their suitcase if they've laundered any. Okay, you can't, you can't bid with money in your hand. You put any amount in the top of your lid in secret and at the same time, everybody drops their lid down. Whoever bet the most gets first pick of the ally, second most, second pick, and so on. If you didn't bid anything, that's fine. You're not going to get an ally. If you did bid money, you have to spend it if you are if you bid enough to actually get a pick for an ally. This is a really interesting choice because you're, bet, you're betting with victory points, which is your money. But some of these allies are just so awesome, it's worth it. And you have to determine how worth it it is. Once that phase is done, we go to the Tribute to the Don. This is where we got to pay Don Corleone what we owe him. Each round up here has a number. That's how many cards you have to discard down to. And again, this can be an agonizing choice because you might want to have some resources for the start of the next round. You might, might want to keep a job card in your hand. You might have to get rid of money. Once that is done, you move the Dawn to the next round and you repeat everything over again. This tells you what color of a tile to place. It tells you if you get a new family member, so as the game progresses, you get more pieces to play with. And it tells you what color of a new business to put down. So you use a blue business for the first two acts. Second two acts is a red business, and that's when the drugs come into play. It's supposed to be thematic with the movie because the family didn't get into the drugs until the third act of the movie. The drug resource is simply wild, and it can be used for blood money, guns, or booze. This is repeated four times at the end of the game. If you have two money cards in your hand, you can put those into your briefcase. Everybody counts up their money. Whoever has the most of each different job color gets five points per color. If there's a tie, then the tied players share. Then you do the turf dominance. You get five points per each region that you're the most dominant in. Whoever has the most at the end of the game is the winner. So that was Godfather. Cool.
Corleone's Empire. I don't know why they just don't call it The Godfather. I, I don't like when titles have subtitles. Let's start off with the rulebook to the game. Very good rulebook. It's laid out really well, easy to understand the rules. There was two ambiguous questions that were not in the rulebook that had to get answered on Board Game Geek. That's not too bad at all. It's very accessible to all gamers and I think just about anyone can learn the game because of the rulebook and how streamlined the rules are. So there's not a lot to get into when you're talking about the components of a cool mini or not game because they are the cream of the crop. There aren't many companies out there that does a better job making components. All of the family member miniatures are all different sculpts. Uh, the thugs all look the same and there's a couple droopy Tommy guns, but the presentation is outstanding. The graphic design. Now, a lot of people I've played this with weren't too fond of the look of the board. I don't think I was at first, but it started growing on me over multiple plays. So I think I kind of like the look of it. Um, the art on the cards is uh, pretty much all just a picture of uh, Don Corleone on the back of everything. And the, uh, the art on the front of the resource cards, the, uh, the money, blood money, guns, drugs, and booze. I like that, uh, that art deco look to those cards. There's not a lot of variety in it though, which is unfortunate. Most of the good art is in the rulebook itself. Now, the mechanics of the game is, once again, an interesting mix from Eric Lang. You've got area control mixed with a worker placement game. That really creates an awesome gameplay experience. The decisions you have to make as to whether you want to go here to get something or you want to go to a specific spot just to put some influence into a territory so that you can get your control marker on top because paying heavy attention to the area control makes for big points at the end of the game if you're dominating many suburbs of New York. The game is so streamlined, I feel like they had this game polished, and then they decided to just keep going over it until the polish was perfect. And I feel that polish when I play this game. There is a smoothness to it. There is a balance to all the math. I feel like the math in this game is really good. And it escalates at a perfect rate from round one when you just have a few markers and the round goes by pretty quick to the end of round four when the board is just full of dudes and there's people in the river. It's got a perfect escalation rate. The gameplay length doesn't overstay its welcome. And this game is like a gateway game. This is like a Ticket the Ride or a, a Lords of Waterdeep would probably be more appropriate. This game kills Lords of Waterdeep for me, but it's got that same wide accessibility. Now, let's talk about theme a little bit. It definitely has that gangster theme with the car bombs and the drive-by shootings, the bodies in the Hudson, uh, you know, shaking down the fronts of business, family members having far-reaching power and, sh and shaking down the backs of all businesses that you're connected to, to the, the blood money cards, the, the drugs. It's all thematically integrated very well. It's super thematic for a worker placement game. However, this does not have the Godfather theme per se, other than the Don's picture on the box and all of the cards, uh, the horse head first player marker, and I guess the Godfather round tracker, which is completely pointless. This doesn't have that Godfather theme. Maybe at an earlier iteration it had it more, and these empty slots in the insert have me excited for an expansion that might actually bring out the Godfather theme a little more, but it certainly has a gangster theme. There's no denying that. 
it has a heavy gangster theme. It plays two to five players, and the more players, the better for me. I like three, four, and five. I like that it plays two players, but the two player experience for me is meh. It's great if I want to teach someone the game, we can play two players. But if I'm going to play a two player game, there's a lot more ahead of the pack than this one I'm going to want to pull out. The game gets a lot of comparisons to Sons of Anarchy, Men of Mayhem by Gale Force 9, another worker placement gangster game. There's, um, they're completely different games. There's, there's no real big similarities other than you're, you're putting your pieces onto an action space and trying to do the action. I really like in Sons of Anarchy the gang war you have where you're actually putting your pieces and fighting another player's pieces when you want to go to the same place as them. However, there is dice rolling on that and that has a luck factor. The consensus over on Reddit is that people seem to like Sons of Anarchy better. I am really quite fond of Sons of Anarchy, but I would give the edge to this game for a couple of reasons. First of all, this game plays two to five players instead of three to four players, like Sons of Anarchy. I think it might be expandable to five. This one is also a little bit more skill-based. The better player is typically going to win. You can get lucky in Sons of Anarchy with the dice rolling. I do love the free trading between your money, guns, and drugs you can do in Sons of Anarchy, but it is not enough to outweigh the smoothness and elegance of The Godfather. Sons of Anarchy is also a very adult-themed game. I have no chance of playing that one with my eight-year-old. However, The Godfather, I think, is pretty accessible to... I would have no quandaries of busting it out with my eight-year-old son. So I think for now I will keep both, but if I had to get rid of one, I would get rid of Sons of Anarchy. This game is going to be a perennial in my collection. I will play it many, many times over the years. The excitement at the end of the game where you're counting up your money and you think you've got it in the bag only to find out another player has just cinched the win. I love that excitement in The Godfather. I love this game. I highly recommend it to just about anyone. Definitely uh, give it a try before you buy. But two really big thing, two really big thumbs up for me. The Godfather, Corleone's Empire. Thanks for watching. Hit me up on social media right here, and I'll see you next time. Thanks so much for watching the Dice Tower videos. Find more great videos and reviews, as well as our top-rated audio podcast at dicetower.com. You can also find other great shows at dicetowernetwork.com. I'm Eric Summerer, and you've been watching The Dice Tower. The Dice Tower is sponsored by Cool Stuff, Inc., where you can find great games for great prices. Cool Stuff, in stock. Check them out at coolstuffinc.com.